John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. It's early in the war fighting for the commanders following the success of Torch, the landing in North Africa. But it's not too early for the, dis the debates between the commanders, the British commanders, the American commanders, and eventually the Russian commanders. So I turn to that now, rather than the battle fighting with Jonathan Jordan, to continue our conversation about American warlords. Roosevelt's high command led America to victory in World War II. John, at Casablanca Conference, Marshal Stimson, Arnold, Hap Arnold of the Air Force, King of the Navy are all present, and they're looking for a strategy that's going to carry the battle to the European continent as fast as possible. The British, however, are reluctant. They are looking to the Mediterranean, to staying in the Mediterranean as long, long as possible, launching on Sicily, launching on Italy, even going farther afield, going east to the Greek islands, and then even on to Turkey and perhaps into the Middle East. Why, John? What was the, the British reluctance? The British reluctance stemmed from, uh, at, at, its, at its genesis, one man, Winston Churchill. Uh, Churchill was uh, famous for trying out creative uh, strategies, but in one place he had gotten gun-shy, and that was uh, the direct route into Nazi Germany. While the Americans believed the fastest way to win the war was to invade northern France and drive straight toward Berlin, uh, Churchill firmly believed that that was the wrong way to approach it. As the British saw it, they had fought the Germans in North Africa, in the Middle East, in the uh, Mediterranean, and on Europe, and uh, they were a tough bunch. Uh, Churchill's view was uh, that we should take a, a circular approach, a peripheral approach, if you will. He wanted to blockade continental Europe from the sea, bomb it from the air, and uh, essentially fund the uh, Russians to fight, it, fight the Germans on the ground. That decision will continue to be made and made, aga made again. We, ca we make that decision over the next two years. Churchill is relentless. FDR, did the commanders, did the generals and the admirals look to FDR to shut Winston up? Or did they, did they think it, well, that even FDR couldn't keep him quiet? At the early stage in the war, the Americans were still getting their feet wet. Uh, by 1943, we'd been involved in the war a full year, but we had not been involved in the war against Germany for very long. The American Joint Chiefs had a uh, short conference with uh, Roosevelt prior to the Casablanca Conference, and at that, uh, Roosevelt did not come down uh, as heavily for the Americans as he thought. Uh, at that pre-Casablanca uh, uh, huddle, if you will, uh, Roosevelt said the British are going to have a plan and they're going to stick to it. And he implied to his generals that he preferred their, their approach, the direct approach to invading northern, northwest France. But he didn't commit to it and he was willing to uh, be persuaded that uh, maybe it's, time, it, it's a better approach to continue the war in the Mediterranean. He was at least movable on that front. The other problem the Americans had was a logistical one. Roosevelt always liked going by himself with a fairly small team, and even though any presidential party is going to number in the hundreds, the American military men came with a few aides, a few boxes of information, and, and whatever else they could carry around in their heads. The British showed up with hundreds of, of coding clerks, of, of aides, of uh, map makers, uh, uh, cryptographers. Uh, they had an entire ship there that could essentially connect Winston Churchill at Casablanca to the British Empire this, almost as well as if he were sitting in Number 10 Downing Street. So the Americans were outgunned on the argument and logistics side to deal with these uh, experienced negotiators, and they also had a president who was not uh, gung-ho for the uh, for their view, he was he could be moved. The Casablanca Conference in January of 1943 sets the European war. However, the question of the Pacific, remember it's Europe first, Pacific then, continues back in Washington. Nimitz is given command of all naval forces that are not to be uh, used by MacArthur. King and MacArthur uh, right now are going at it, but they don't agree with each other. Ernest King commanding all the navies, MacArthur commanding, I guess what you'd have to say is, uh, his own view of the world, MacArthur sitting in Brisbane. This contest will be, uh, I consider it an intramural contest in the U.S. Did FDR, 
need to, or look to settle this as well. He looks to be the, taking the same passive approach he did with Winston Churchill, allowing MacArthur to cause trouble. Passive is an excellent word for it. Uh, for, for, from one side, Roosevelt had to look at MacArthur the same way he might look at the, uh, the boa constrictor in the elementary school class. Behind glass, it looks pretty fearsome. And as long as you don't uh, mishandle it, you're going to be all right. MacArthur, as Roosevelt well knew, was highly popular in the United States. So he could not do anything to, uh, to come down too hard on, uh, on Douglas MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur wanted a different approach to Japan than the, Jap- uh, than, the, uh, the than the Navy did. MacArthur's approach was to go through New Guinea, the du- the Dutch East Indies, through the Philippines, and and from there up to Japan, the southwestern approach to Japan. The Navy wanted to go across the Central Pacific, and both sides were arguing over the bombers that Hap Arnold had there to support their their efforts. So uh, so Roosevelt had to. Uh, Keep kind of a take a careful approach with MacArthur, who could be dangerous politically if uh, if not handled properly, and uh, as a result, he uh, he really played both sides. He he to, he encouraged both sides. He did not get involved too much, and and as we'll see, uh, that kind of laissez-faire approach, uh, the same approach that uh, Joseph Stalin took toward the Battle of Berlin later, of letting the generals race themselves. Uh, that was something he would hold to until uh, the summer of 1944. One more detail about FDR. Chiang Kai-shek was at this point established by Stilwell, by Marshall, by everyone as ineffective. I'm being diplomatic here. And mm-hmm. yet uh, Roosevelt continued to urge the supply of Chiang Kai-shek. Though there was evidence he wasn't fighting the Japanese, though there was evidence he was either sp- sending it to the black market or warehousing it to, f- to continue the Civil War afterwards. Why? What did Roosevelt get from Chiang Kai-shek? Roosevelt saw China as being one of the four great powers of the post-war world. It, it took a while, but obviously in the long run, uh, there was a lot to be said for that. But in the short run, uh, Roosevelt had uh, basically a, a, a blind spot. Uh, one of his blind spots was Charles de Gaulle, who he consistently underestimated. The other was Chiang Kai-shek, whom he overestimated. And uh, Roosevelt believed that the need to keep China fighting uh, the Japanese was just as important as the need to keep the Russians fighting the Germans. So he was prepared to do whatever he needed to support Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, but that uh, support for Ch- uh, Chiang led him to, uh, I think, uh, probably overestimate the, his effectiveness and the respect that he had among the population as a whole. We go to the Trident Conference. This is in D.C. and Washington in May of 43. It reiterates the same contest we've already identified. However, now they're at least putting names to the uh, battles that they want to fight. The British want to fight in the Mediterranean. The Americans want Roundup, or what becomes Roundhammer, which eventually will be Overlord. The Americans state again and again that we must get to Europe now. We must go right to Germany. You have a wonderful analogy, I don't know if it's at Trident or Quadrant, where the British play English football, soccer, which is a game of improvisation, of opportunism. The Americans believe in American football, which is power up the center of the field, dominate the other side with set plays. Do they ever understand this? Is that an irony that they themselves talked about in 43 and 44, John? They did not think about it in those direct terms. The American planners, uh, Eisenhower, who had worked for a long time as as one of Marshall's operations heads, and uh, most of the other uh, senior American generals were enamored with American football. Uh, They followed it. They loved it. And and that was the approach they took. Prepare a, prepare a smart plan and execute it violently and vigorously. That was the American way of winning the war. The British, of course, were more fluid and more opportunistic. Uh, Churchill later said that the American mind works in terms of setting up a proper foundation, and then events will move along the way you want them to. The British mind, he said, does not quite work that way. It, it puts a little bit more emphasis on opportunism. And so that is the reason the British were more willing to entertain thoughts of 
going into places such as the Dota Canese and, and near in the Aegean Sea, uh, places around Turkey, uh, Norway, other places that the United States thought were merely peripheral. But at uh, by the time we get to the Trident talks in Washington in, in May of 1943, we finally get some congealing and a consensus. Uh, the British sense was we've pushed things into the Mediterranean for a long time, but we're going to have to start agreeing to what the Americans are looking for. They're becoming powerful, and they make, uh, they're, they're quite right that eventually we're going to have to face the Germans on the continent. So, so Trident in, in, in Washington is where, for the first time, the British began to move uh, to accept the reality that the Americans were eventually going to get their way. It would be revisited many times, but that's where it begins. American Warlords, How Roosevelt's High Command Led America to Victory in World War II. Jonathan, jo Jonathan Jordan is the author. There are many cultural uh, upsets at, during this period. The Katyn Forest Massacre in Poland, which is suppressed in the major American news. And FDR leads the suppression. And there are race riots in Detroit and Mobile. There's a race riot in L.A. We're, sp we're concentrating on the commanders because while the whole world is at war, the plans for the future are where the battle is going to be won. And when we come back, we're going to turn to the next major contest between the Americans and the British. It'll be in Quebec on the Plains of Abraham. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Jonathan Jordan's book is American Warlords. It's the story of Roosevelt's high command. And we go to Quebec. It is August of 43. It's hot there. At, uh, they're gathering again to argue one more time over where they're going to spend their resources. They do not have an endless amount of equipment and men and air aircraft and landing craft to do, to do all the operations that are in front of them continually. They've landed in Sicily. They're looking probably to commit themselves to Italy. Sicily is Operation Mus Husky. When they come to Quebec again, there is this contest about the Pacific and uh, demanding sh uh, landing craft and ships and resources, and again, Italy. John, the battle between oh, do we give more resources to the Pacific and we do, do we give more resources to the U.K., uh, to, uh, to Italy, is that again Winston Churchill trying to drain off resources to delay uh, Overlord until 45? Churchill naturally uh, was reluctant to, to delay Overlord, and by this point the Americans uh, knew that, and they were very nervous about his commitment to Overlord, uh, previously called Roundup, as a concept. Uh, but the Pacific was also a, an independent uh, issue for the Americans because uh, to the, much of the American public, particularly on the West Coast, it was the Japanese who started the war, got us into it, and uh, there were good men and Marines dying out in the Pacific, and those men needed to be supported. The British, uh, the, the British military chiefs, in particular, understood that the American Joint Chiefs were uh, taking a lot of heat in the press for, uh, for and from indirectly from MacArthur for not providing enough bomber support, enough um, naval support, and so on for uh, the Americans out there. So they they really were trying trying to find a way to make three halves of one pie. There is a moment we must tell at Quebec. Mountbatten, one of the British commanders, brings in a subaltern, I, I picture. This is, uh, this is Operation Habakkuk. It's a secret weapon, sort of. You can put together a, a, a conglomeration that floats on water and is strong enough to land aircraft, claims Mountbatten. And to prove it to the Joint Chiefs, they're all, the commanders, they're all standing around. He has... Uh, his uh, assistant pull out a weapon and fire in the room, fire into this conglomeration. What happens, John? Uh, this was one of those uh, times when the American and British chiefs were uh, were frazzled with each other. They'd been negotiating for days. Uh, as uh, as as uh, General Alan Brooke, the, the the George Marshall of the British uh, Imperial General Staff, said, 
uh, this is the sixth meeting with these Americans that I've run, and I do not feel I can possibly stand anymore. So as, the, as these men are coming out of a tense meeting where they're trying to, to, uh, to parse through the Battle of the Atlantic and China, Burma, India, and the Mediterranean and Europe, uh, they, they run into – uh, Lord Mountbatten, who, uh, with the look of a fuller brush salesman, tells them about this new pro- th- this new uh, process called har- called piecrete. It's a mixture of ice and uh, wood pulp. And to show them how uh, show the generals how uh, strong it is, he uh, sets it up in the back of their meeting room. He has an assistant pull out a revolver and fire it into the ice. The ice shatters. Then he has the the assistant fire it at the piecrete. Well, the piecrete was harder. And the bullet ricocheted and buried itself into the wall behind the American chiefs, uh, just going past Admiral King's leg. Uh, the the uh, outside the door, some of the uh, staffers who were listening to the arguments before, uh, one of them said, "My God, they're shooting at each other now." Did the uh, Marshall, did Marshall and King and Stimson, did they argue about sharing with the British about the security problem? Sharing with the British was uh, really more at the political level at this point. It certainly was a security problem, and Marshall's man on the ground, General Leslie Groves, had to deal with it uh, and was uh, in the end responsible for security for the Manhattan Project. Uh, but uh, the the problem really percolated up to the level of Churchill, Roosevelt, and Harry Hopkins, Roosevelt's assistant. Uh, King was told very little about the uh, about the Manhattan Project during this time. Marshall was detached from it because uh, he didn't fully understand the physics of it too well and in the end just had to rely on what others told him. So uh, this was something that was an irritant, not a major one, but it was an irritant that both uh, Roosevelt and Churchill decided they needed to put behind them. So we agreed to, to allow more British access to our atomic research. We need to get on to the Tehran conference, which happens later in the year. This is 1943. But a note here about the Pacific. At this point, you mentioned, John, they've got three routes to the Pacific. The southwestern route, that's MacArthur, and he wants to get back to the Philippines to fulfill his promise. Then there's the route in the north from the Aleutians, and the one that King wants is the central route through the Marianas moving on to Japan. However, King wants Formosa. He wants to cut the Philippines out. Did he do that on purpose? Did he know that that would stymie MacArthur's political plans? King, I think, was indifferent to what MacArthur uh, wanted. Uh, he, he didn't give a damn about uh, what the Army in general and MacArthur thought specifically. As he saw it, the Navy had been studying the problem of how to reconquer the Pacific for two decades, and the Navy knew best. As he saw it, if uh, we can get some uh, real estate on the China coast, if we can take Formosa, we will have a fine place to anchor our ships and to base our bombers, and we can blockade and bombard Japan into submission. That was the Navy way. I note that in this is a period of time where it's very difficult. To, you're moving around a lot. We're dealing with the commanders, and we're moving on to Tehran later in the year. However, even this early on, it's a, uh, everyone's aware that MacArthur is flirting with politics, correct, John? They're not ignorant of this anywhere. There was a uh, MacArthur for President bubble that began forming in uh, around September of 1943. It began out in the Midwest. Uh, MacArthur's adopted hometown was Milwaukee. The Midwest was an isolationist stronghold, and that was the kind of place where Republicans thought they might be able to get some traction to unseat uh, Roosevelt in the 1944 elections. Jonathan Jordan is the author. It's American Warlord, and we're discussing the warlords. I just nod to the politics a little bit because one of your subplots, John, is that Roosevelt was never divorced from the politics of of, of the battlefield decisions he was making. The puzzle to me is Marshall, who was oft times divorced from politics. I hope we have a, a note about how he got involved with Dewey. Marshall and King and Stimson also acted as if politics was something that was secondary. Actually, they didn't want to get their hands dirty. Did Roosevelt forgive them for that? Uh, he, he did. Uh, he understood that uh, that, that they, their job was to be, in some sec- sense, technicians, and he understood his role as uh, commander-in-chief to be the person uh, pushing the drive. Uh, one time he sat back and uh, 
in his Oval Office, I think it was during his 879th press conference, and as uh, reporters crowded around his desk, he told them, you can't leave things to the military, otherwise nothing gets done. That's a dreadful thing to say, but it, the fact is if you get almost all admirals and generals from different nations talking over plans, they spend a month or two, or two talking about why each won't work. You get a series of no's. But if you get certain laymen to stick pins into them, prod them, and say you've got to have an answer to this by so many days, then you get results. That was his view of the way the military men uh, uh, would would naturally work in the way they uh, the Constitution probably intended them to work. Jonathan Jordan, American Warlords. I'm John Batchelor. When we come back, the Tehran Conference. This is the John Batchelor Show. <laughs> 